warning, this episode does contain some graphic details and descriptions of violence and sexual violence. He is perhaps Ireland's most infamous killer. Graeme Dwyer, a prominent architect from the leafy suburbs of Fox Rock in Dublin, appeared to most as an unassuming, normal man. But beneath the surface was a depraved, perverted killer who thought he'd gotten away with the perfect murder. Last week, Dwyer lost his battle against his conviction for the 2013 murder of Elaine O'Hara in what was a closely watched legal case that potentially had massive implications for the justice system here in Ireland. On today's Shattered Lives, we decided we'd take a look back at the case against Graeme Dwyer, discuss his fall from grace, and what might be next in his never-ending battle for freedom. Okay, so I'm joined today by Mick O'Toole again. Hello, Mick. Hello, Paul Healy. How are you? Not too bad. So we've decided we're going to discuss the case against Graeme Dwyer today for obvious reasons. Um... He, he lost his appeal of his conviction last week, which was obviously a monumental story. Uh, we discussed it briefly last week, and you rightfully predicted that um, that he would indeed lose his appeal. That's exactly what's happened. Um, but we felt now was the right time to kind of sit down and really go through the facts forensically of this case, because it really is an extraordinary um, case and a, and a crime story that continues to make headlines as example by what happened last week. Do you know, I've known... Uh, Graham Dwyer has been in my life for a decade, almost a decade. So the the remains of Elaine O'Hara, as everybody knows, were found in Killicky Wood on the thirteenth of September, two thousand and thirteen, and that was Graham Dwyer's forty first birthday. By pure coincidence, it's one of the many coincidences in this case. But that man, from October the eighteenth, when he appeared in court. That man has been a major part of my professional life. And I have to be honest, I did let him get to me personally. I've said this before, in the trial, it's the only, I've, you and I, in many cases have we covered, the only trial where I physically wanted to smack somebody who was, away, who was in the dock. And it was after, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about this, it was after a, a piece of his fiction. Now, I'm a fiction writer, so I take great exception at him being writing anything that's described as fiction, but it was, and it was his rape fantasy about a, a kidnapping and raping a woman in Newcastle, which we presumed to be in England. And it was so horrific. I was sitting, I, I, during the trial, I sat about 10 feet away from Dwyer, and I wanted to get up and smack him after it, just because of the contents of it and the way he talked about degrading women in that and, you know, various other things. So I may have lost a bit of objectivity when it comes to Green Dwyer. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I mean, you sat every day in that trial, didn't you? So, I mean, you, you couldn't help, but it couldn't help but become personal to you. Um, you know, much like sitting through the Hutch trial, you kind of you, you become so invested in it. But there was something about, in particular, um, the Graham Dwyer case, I suppose, that's just so staggering. Like he was on on the outset, such a normal person you know you're you're and and a, and a very successful person a successful architect uh and and had a, a lovely home there in fox rock and a wife and kids and you know he's the person next door he's your friend well you know what i mean he's it's, 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 on the outset he's the average uh, above average irish person doing well for himself in life and then to find out this secret other side that he had the secret life um of depravity uh, and the crime that he carried out in in secret and obviously with his intelligence he appeared to think that he was going to get away with it and as you saw from all the facts in the case he did live two lives didn't he well i, mean, I always say this i, I don't want to give many uh, credit but i mean when i did i did write a, a, a book of fiction and one of the aspects of that book of fiction that i wrote was about a secret life and i have to say I'm not going to say he was the inspiration for it, but I took the way Dwyer lived the secret life. Uh, He had three lives. He had the father, the family man. He had the slightly nerdy hobby of being a model aircraft flyer, which is grand, let him at it. And then he had this secret life of being a sexual sadist. And I couldn't, it took me a long time to get my head around that. And to be fair, I took from the Dwyer case for my book because part of my book is about somebody living a secret life. And it's all, look, I'm not going to go down, I'm not going to try to promote my book on the back of him. But it did have such a massive effect from, on me that he impacted on my writing as a fiction writer because I could not get my head around the secret life that he led. And he, look, he almost, he very, very nearly got away with it. A couple of coincidences, a couple of things, and he'd be living a life as a free man. Well, it's only really by 
nearly sheer miracle isn't it that 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 his uh the, the crime was uncovered because i mean the remain the remains of elaine o'hara were discovered um but the guards certainly didn't believe that she was murdered um and then there were there were signs within her life which we'll speak about in detail um that she had severe mental health problems uh, and and i think perhaps there was an assumption early on that she'd sadly taken her own life and it, it wasn't really believed in any way uh, that she was the victim of a crime um and it's only because of of certain things that miraculously happened weather changes and and a heroic guard of finding the right pieces um in a river uh, that that ultimately led to graham door you might talk a bit about that mick just you know the happenstance of coming across those those items in the water that yes so as uh, yes a significant amount of coincidences really as i said elaine's body she went missing on the 22nd of august 2012 but her body was found almost exactly a year later, well, just, uh, maybe 13 months later, almost exactly to the day. It was on the 13th of September. A French lady called Magali Vernier was a dog walker. She was walking her dog, her, walking the dogs in the Dublin mountains in Killikey Wood. And one of the dogs went into the wood, came back, and they made the discovery of uh, what was believed to be a human remains. So now that was on the 13th. On the 10th of September, so three days earlier, a couple of fishermen had been at Vartu Reservoir near Roundwood in County Wicklow. As you say, Paul, the, the reservoir had drained largely because it was a very dry summer that year. And they found some bits of clothing and they found, you know, bits of sex toys and various things like that. Went to the Garda station, guarded James O'Donoghue, really one of the heroes, one of the untold heroes of this case. Spent several days going to and from the reservoir on the 16th of, of, of September, so three days after Elaine's remains were found. He got down on his hands and knees and he did an awful lot of, he put it literally through muck on his hands and knees and he found loads of, of items, including one was a, a fob from Dunn Stores. And he was able to take that fob from Dunn Stores and identify it as Elaine O'Hara. Now, by this stage, the guards were zeroing in on Elaine O'Hara. There was a number of missing women. They, I think they were satisfied very early on that it was a woman. There was a number of women that they believed it was and I think more or less by the 16th they had identified her because I remember hearing right the missing woman is a lady called Elaine O'Hara and by pure coincidence they have just found all her items of clothing in Vartu Reservoir so that was one huge coincidence and I would venture if James O'Donoghue hadn't got down on his hands and knees and searched Vartu Reservoir there may have been enough to sustain a conviction but it was finding those items including two phones what which would become known as the master and slave phones that led in my view to the conviction of Graham Dwyer. So James O'Donoghue's role cannot be underplayed in this. But you know what we might do first, and I'm hoping you might do this, Paul, this whole thing has been about Graham Dwyer. I think we should spend a few minutes, as ever, because this pod is about shattered lives. Let's talk about the victim first. Let's talk about the person who was Elena O'Hara. She deserves it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, the victims sometimes are forgotten in these things, and, and, and especially when we're talking about someone the likes of Graham Dwyer. There's a lot to talk about, so you, you, you kind of do find the victim gets lost in this. So, yeah, it's worth mentioning. We said we would speak a bit about the background of Elaine. Um, so Elaine O'Hara, she was born uh, on St. Patrick's Day, actually, 1976. Uh, her parents, Frank and Eileen, um, she she, were, uh, she lived in Kalini with them in South Dublin, and then she, she went to, to school in South Dublin. Um, but things started to go wrong for Elaine kind of early on in her life, around the age of 12. As, as I mentioned already, she had severe mental health issues and they started to unfortunately rear their ugly head um and by the age of 14 they'd gone down even more rapidly and uh you know there, there were issues in her personal life with a, a close friend of hers had died in a car crash and she was being bullied as well and then she was starting to self-harm so she she went to seek help she went and sought help in in various different places uh saint edmund's uh Bury mental hospital there in lucan um she was admitted at the age of 17 there um, and it was concluded that she basically had a personality disorder, um, low self-esteem, feelings of worthlessness, and uh, that she was suffering from a condition that basically meant that she had the inability to enjoy herself. Um, and and I believe it had been said of her as well that she kind of had the, the mental age of a of a 15 year old. Um, so she was someone who, in spite of all of those struggles, I mean, she went on to live uh, a life as a childcare worker and had friends and was well regarded by many people. But privately, she was having many, many of the, of these struggles throughout her life. Um, and 
as a result of that, uh, an individual like Graeme Dwyer came into her life uh, and manipulated her to uh, to a degree because she had, uh, I suppose, a mental condition where she believed that she should die. Now, she didn't want to kill herself, but she believed that she should ultimately die. And then you have someone like Dwyer, whose ultimate sexual fantasy was to kill somebody. So she was, in a way, the perfect victim for him. Um, just to go into she was at she her mental health issues i mean it, it ended it up with her being admitted to the hospital uh in in july of 2012 and there were concerns for her mental health at, at, at that point in time and and this is as i say when her body did eventually turn up uh in 2013 i suppose initially then maybe there wasn't surprise because people in her life knew of her mental health difficulties and and thought perhaps she had taken her own life um but elaine had told her father about Graham Dwyer, she had, she had stated uh, that she was having this relationship with this individual and concerns were expressed about the nature of that relationship um, with, with, in, with, with the person she only described as an architect and that that relationship um, had happened in to, what she told her father in, in 2008. And that's something we'll talk about in detail again later in that that relationship happened, it fizzled away and then Graeme Dwyer ultimately uh, came back to her at a very vulnerable point in her life. Um, and and these text messages were exchanged that ultimately led to her being lured to her death. There were concerns expressed for Elaine uh, and her mental health, as I mentioned. And um, Elaine had basically told a friend in St. Edmundsbury that she was seeing a man and that she had asked him uh, to kill her but that he wouldn't and then the friend said that she was shocked and that they never discussed it again um a quote that i have here from a friend of elaine's which is elaine told me that she enjoyed getting cut by men she told me she enjoyed the release of blood uh, that's a quote that the, the lady actually gave during the trial um so there were concerns for not only Elaine's mental health but the fact that she was speaking to this uh, this architect this individual who had expressed uh, and she had expressed desires for this individual to kill her. Um, when it comes to her, her friend as well, she said she she had advised her to take precautions. I told her she was playing a, a dangerous game. Um, she said Elaine, all Elaine wanted was to be loved and she wanted attention. And she told Elaine to keep notes uh, when she was meeting this particular individual and to get details of his name and address in case anything happened. So there were serious concerns for her well-being and the fact that she was meeting this particular individual. Yeah, and so we do know that the relationship started between Dwyer and Elaine in and around 2006. In 2008, she, as you say, she told her father Frank about it. And, you know, I, Frank, he seems like a really decent man. He gave evidence in the trial and he was brutally, as you would expect of any decent man, he was really honest in the trial and he gave evidence about how Elaine told him about the relationship, how she told him that she was in a relationship with a, a, an architect that he tied her up and used to masturbate over her. So you can you imagine any father listening to a daughter talking about that? But that's testament, I think, to, to, of uh, Mr. O'Hara because he, he gave full and frank evidence and he held nothing back. And I, I must say, I really, really felt sorry for him. But heels of the hunt, in late 2008, the relationship ended and our information is that Elaine ended the, the relationship because she wasn't happy about being cut. And, and that stopped. But in March... 2011, really in a crucial time, I think we're on the 23rd of March 2011, Elaine got a, a text from a known number going, hi, hope you're keeping well. And it's, it's just so incongruous, the sort of message anybody would get from anybody if you changed their phones or whatever. Now, you know, in the era of iPhones, your numbers and all your messages carry across. But back in the day, 2011, when you did get a new number, sometimes numbers wouldn't carry, be ported over and that sort of stuff so her number and anyway it turns out it was a, a burner phone he'd got and she mm. went who's this and he said it's your friend we used to play together and I really miss it and it's such an incongruous and normal sounding sentence but that effectively was the start of the death knell for Olin O'Hara because that was Graham Dwyer getting back in touch with them and very very quickly they started the BDSM relationship again and, if, and essentially he lured her to her death and we know everything that happened it was 22nd of august so for 
18 months they had been in this relationship when he was talking about cutting her he was talking about his urge to rape his urge to stab his urge to, how he was getting turned on by the sight of blood and, and all that sort of thing so on the 22nd of august elaine as you mentioned paul elaine in the month of, of july had been in a hospital she had had a relapse she got out and i think it was the day before maybe the, and i think it was the 22nd and he basically started texting her lured her to shangana cemetery from there she told he told her go down to the shore and wait i went down to the shore i, I was unaware of this it's it's on the coast and there there is a quite a, a, a high shoreline so the last text on these phones that the guardy discovered by three james o'donoghue james o'donoghue's work was go down to the shore and wait and that was the last anybody saw of her a runner saw her at shangana cemetery on on the on the 22nd in the evening and he was able to correlate it with his running up so they were able to find out exactly the time that he saw her and that was the last time anybody saw her and that was the mystery the mystery was all gone until the 13th of september the following year when graham dwyer and his wife coincidentally both of them their birthdays on the 13th of september they went out to a mexican restaurant in the in the center of dublin to celebrate their birthday dwyer was cool calm and collected and at the same time Elaine's remains were being recovered by Magali Vernier just a few hours earlier. And that set off a whole chain of Incredible. events. It, it really is. The, 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 the coincidences in this case are just absolutely... And I think, wrong. am I right in saying, uh, I think it was actually on the front page of the Star, there's a photograph of Graeme Dwyer uh, in front of a birthday cake celebrating his birthday. I think taken the same... If that's not the same day, then it would certainly... Was was that was the story that you know that it was his birthday the same day the body was recovered and there's a photo of him with a birthday cake was that from the same day or we we certainly have a picture of him celebrating his birthday just off the top of my head it may have been because we did a lot of research in between him appearing in court and the trial because he, he, he appeared in court on the eighteenth of October, twenty thirteen and his trial wasn't it started in january 2015 so it was more than it was 18 months or 18 months or whatever whatever the maths are there it was an awful long time and i tell you what was really interesting we knew that he'd been charged we knew that this man called graham dwyer had appeared in court but it really only exploded about a week later when he went to court to try and get bail just to explain to listeners when you're charged with murder in ireland you appear at the district court that's the first hearing and the district court does not have power to give bail when it comes to a murder charge. So he was remanded in custody. So what you have to do then is you have to go to the high court to try and seek bail. And there was a, a bail hearing. Now it's called what we call, or the guards call a section two bail hearing. In other words, there's plenty of evidence given, but the section two order means that journalists aren't, you're told you're not allowed to write anything that's prejudicial. So there was basically what you say is, Graham Dwyer applied for bail and Graham Dwyer was refused bail. But in between then, all the evidence was given. We just couldn't report it, but we could write it down. And I wasn't at it, but I remember getting the notes of it. And Paul, did you ever have one of those holy shit moments in journalism? <laughs> Reading the Dwyer, the yeah. transcript of the Dwyer bail hearing, right? It was uber holy shit. Um, it was just, because it's all about this madman who has a, a desire to stab and cut and murder and kill women. And we were looking at, I, I remember finding his, LinkedIn profile and his photograph, we, we ran it, everybody ran it. It looks like a mugshot. He's staring, staring straight at the, the, the camera, right? And he's acting pretty mm -hmm. big bollocks, mm -hmm. I thought, you know. But it's great because it looked like a mugshot. And, you know, you see somebody's picture and you go, oh, that's him. And then you hear about this and you go, holy Jesus. I, I honestly, I was flabbergasted. And that was the start of the, the Graham Dwyer show. So we were aware that this trial, because there were plenty of, he went to the Supreme Court and everything to try and get bail in a long long lasting affair until the trial so all the journalists in dublin knew this was going to be a big trial but even then it just goes to show you when the trial started we were lucky to know five percent of what happened and throughout the trial it was just one thing after the other after the other after the other and it was it was, it was one of those trials where you just go jeez every day was just it was a front page every day i think for us huge yeah and I, I think, you know, not to get ahead of myself a bit, but I, I can recall, um, I think I was in the Independent, the Irish Independent at the time, and it was, it was, it was as you said, on the front page every day. And I can recall the feeling in the newsroom, uh, you know, people, everyone was kind of being asked, what way do you think this is going to go? And right up to the very end, I think there was a doubt as to whether he would actually be convicted, in spite of all of the evidence, because... Um, in, in many ways it's a hugely circumstantial case although 
an unbelievable amount of circumstantial evidence when you put it all together. But I mean, for you personally, just sitting there every day, am I right in saying that even you had your doubts as to whether this was actually going to end up in a conviction? I had done two profiles of Graham Dwyer. One was mm. for uh, if he was convicted and the other was if he was acquitted. And it was businessman, architect, can I get back to his own? And I was I was reading it a few days ago, actually. So it's upon acquittal. <laughs> so, I mean, look, people, wow. that's what you got to do because we were, you know, so it's like, what are we going to do if X happens? Well, if X happens, we can do this because you have to have it. You know, we did like most papers. We probably did 16 pages the day after the conviction. So you have to have an awful lot of material. You can't all, you couldn't possibly write them in one day. So it was, you know, I'm not saying we were, we were hedging our bets. Now, personally, I didn't have a clue. I think sometimes you can get so close to it. It reminded me of the Joe Riley trial. It was exactly the same. We were sitting there and we were going, what the hell, is, or what are the jury going to do? Now, in both those cases, they were unanimous. Because we were expecting maybe after a couple of, I think after, is it after two days, the they can, judge can take a, a majority decision? No, straight away, unanimous. And sometimes we're too close to it. So we don't look through it through the eyes of the jury. We look through it through the eyes of journalists and we're looking and writing everything down and, oh, I don't know about this. But do you know what? I always remember Michael O'Higgins, one of Ireland's great defence barristers, senior counsel. He was on RTE TV the day of the Joe Riley verdict in 20, 2007. And I remember him clear as day saying, now he's a defence barrister. I remember him saying, uh, circumstantial evidence is perfect. It's very, very good evidence. It's not weakened evidence, it's circumstantial evidence. So it's just as good as, you know, real evidence. You know, that's effectively what he said. And that always that, that has always struck with me about how strong circumstantial evidence can be because everybody thinks circumstantial evidence, oh, it's suboptimal. It's whatever, it's whatever evidence can be put, put to the jury. And, you know, credit to the Guardi, the evidence in this case, it was meticulous and they built up a fantastic picture. And you know what? Dwyer drew the picture for him himself because of his chutzpah and his hubris and he thought it was the dog's bollocks really so you know he walked himself into a trap yeah and like you know i know we'll talk we'll get on to his appeal but i mean one one central point of his appeal was 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 the legality of 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 this phone uh data evidence but as you know i mean and, and this is just somebody who was just following and reading the case myself i mean when you when you read all those texts in their entirety the chain of messages between elaine o'hara and graham dwyer and it gets to that point of go to the shore and wait i mean i don't know how you can come out without any doubt that that he he definitely committed this murder and it but it adds up with the timeline of everything else and all the other evidence and i mean there, there's a significant chunk of evidence in this case that has nothing to do with phone evidence um for example with um graham dwyer's previous relationship with, with which he has a a, a son uh, and mrs M- Miss mcshay uh, gave evidence in relation to her relationship with, with graham dwyer and 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 told everyone on the stand um, that he had this stab fantasy and that at one stage even a knife had been brought into the bedroom um, so you know that corroborates just some of the the evidence in relation to his fantasy sexual fantasy to stab somebody um, and there are plenty plenty of other evidence which I'm sure you can recall throughout the trial that corroborated the mobile phone evidence the text messages yeah so well, the guards built a picture and I think they, they built an excellent picture and, I, and speaking to barristers prosecutors and defenders they they said they said this not in this case but just you know experts who know more than me about the rules of evidence and all they, they thought it was a very very strong case and it was a very good case and i remember you know when the jury was out i was talking to barristers and they were going yeah not a bother he's ghost and i i you know because we're not experts in evidence i was going are you sure he's going oh ah, yeah yeah he's done for so but just well, let's talk about the appeal because this this thing about phone data has been overhanging since 2018 when dwyer was first charged we, you and I have a facility where we can check high court records. And I remember before he appeared in court and his trial started, we noticed that he was suing the state. And we later found out that was because he was suing the state over the state accessing phone records, phone data connected to him. Now, um, this appeal centred on, one of the, the main points of the appeal was about that phone data. But that was only about his work phone. And that was about, you know, he was on the here, he was driving along the M50 here, the cell site analysis. See the two phones that were found in the, the Vartu Reservoir, they're called the Master and Slave. The state argued that one was used by Dwyer, the other was used by Ara. That didn't enter the, uh, the appeal at all because he denied that they were his. And the, it was those two phones, I think, that brought an awful lot, awful lot of evidence to bear because in those phones there were text messages that Guardy were able to recover. And they used those messages, amongst other things, 
Mr Justice George Birmingham in the Court of Criminal Appeal called it good old-fashioned Garda detective work and they did. So let's give a few examples of things that Garda used on the texts that were able to show a link to guard to, to Dwyer. So for example, um, on the 4th of April, Mrs O'Hara sent, uh, uh, Elaine, Miss O'Hara sent a message to the green phone which the state said was Dwyer's burner, another burner phone. Do you want to collect your keys tonight? And then Dwyer, the green phone, to Miss O'Hara. I have a committee meeting tonight. We'll get them next time I'm over. So the Guardian established that Dwyer, who was, a, as I said, a model aircraft flyer, had attended a committee meeting of his model aircraft flying club that night. He then he talked about on the 18th of April, um, when we're we going to get the meet up. And he replied, we will see. My car is out of action. And he was talking about how it cost him four thousand euro to fix. Guardy were able to go back and see that his car at that time his car was in for repairs and it cost just short of four thousand euro. He also mentioned get yeah he also mentioned getting pay cuts, uh, and they were able to establish around the same time that he had suffered pay cuts. He also uh, mentioned that he came fifth in a competition in Wicklow and they were able to establish that he had been a part of a flying club competition in April and had come fifth. So he left an he left an awful lot of clues about himself and um, that Gardy were able to build up a picture and establish that it was Graham Dwyer. So even if the, the phone data uh, chunk of the appeal was about them accessing his work phone and even then there was a grey gray area of that because you and I have work numbers Paul, They're technically, we, you and I are technically not the you know, owners of those numbers. It's Reach and the, and the Star who, well it's, no, definitely in my case, they're the they own the accounts. I own the handset, they don't own the accounts. So even on that case, could he claim that it was his data because it was so, it was owned by somebody else? So it was a bit of a grey area. But there was so much investigation outside the phone data aspect, which really was a sort of a roadmap that, I mean, I know a colleague of ours said, even if he won on the phone data, he probably would have lost. And I, I think I think there there is uh, something to that. I think the investigation by the guard he was so strong and so good that really he, he was goosed. But there were other aspects of the appeal which we may as well talk to talk about now. One was about uh, what the reliance of call data. Another was about um, the fairness of the trial and the, the uh, prejudice in the appellant. Now one of those key aspects was there were several issues. One was a, you know about media coverage and all that sort of thing. But another was that at one stage, Mr. Justice Tony Hunt, who was the trial judge in the case, was looking at something. Sarah Skeet, a guard, an analyst, had produced a map, and she, she, the, the court heard the, court, the appeal heard that Mr. Justice Tony Hunt. This is one of the grounds for the appeal. Mr. Justice Tony Hunt looked up, looked at Dwyer, glared at him, shook his head, and looked down. And th- there were other issues, you know, say about media coverage. Say about you. Know, we actually got to mention. I have to say. The Irish Times, the Star, and the Journal. I did the story that we do it. We call it a prelim the day before the trial starts. So the day of the trial appearing, I wrote uh, a Dublin architect based architect is due to go on trial, charged with murder of Elaine O'Hara, and I said in it, he is in custody. No, I was just and the the Irish Times said he was in custody, so I was in good company. And the Journal said he was in custody. Now that was raised at the start. No, it was before the jury had been impaneled. It was that morning, so you know it was out at seven o'clock, ten o'clock. The jury was impaneled, and the next day they start. But there were concerns raised about my article, the Irish Times article. Now, not not in the cause of retrial, but I think the judge said that that was sort of like a, put down as a as a marker. But you just had to be careful. And there were various other things during the trial about you know one outlet had a picture of Dwyer with two prison officers beside him. Now we all know that you're not allowed to put pictures in of accused wearing handcuffs. That's prejudicial. The Supreme Court ruling way back in the day, I think it was, it, 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 it was, it was about the old guard of drugs unit years and years ago. There was an appeal in, appeal in relation to that. So always very careful. And the, and the paper didn't do that, but they put Dwyer in beside two prison officers and that gave the impression that to people that he was in custody. So you just had to be so careful. So basically the, the, the appeal court rejected that. The appeal court rejected uh, another aspect of the appeal that there should have been a, a, a directed verdict, if not guilty, because there was no cause of death given to the jury. In other words, nobody, there was nothing said about how Elaine O'Hara had died. And, and the defence raised the issue of, well, they, we, we did speak about Elaine's mental health and they did raise the issue of suicide. But the judge rejected that. So, and there was also about 
questions about you know leaks to the media. For example, people knew while Dwyer was being questioned that I think it was Black Rock Garda Station by Detective Sergeant Peter Woods and Jim Detective Guard Jim Mulligan. They couldn't have done it because they were inside. But the leaks appeared in the media and on the news and we all had it in the papers about a man being, being arrested and some very small details. And he definitely wasn't identified. So that was raised as an issue. So, But the big thing was about the phone data. And the judge said, effectively, the phone data is not that significant. He said that effectively the, the guard investigation was so good that there were plenty of other things that pointed beyond reasonable doubt to Dwyer. Now, I have to say, we, we did speak about this, Paul, in the run-up. I was I was always of the belief that he would lose his appeal, but I didn't. It didn't stop me being nervous on Friday. I had, you know, the butterflies. I I because I had I have COVID. I couldn't go, so I was watching it on Twitter, right? And I was sitting there and I was refreshing uh, our our news editor Billy Scanlon, and I were refreshing Twitter every five seconds to see what Frank Greeny or Arlo O'Donnell were saying. So I was I was pretty nervous. But the reason why I was so confident, uh, you know, look. We're not experts in anything, but we know how to talk to people who are experts. And I had spoken to several senior counsels and other eminent barristers who said, nah, he doesn't have a chance. And I was told that that, that most barristers, if you took a straw poll of barristers in the law library, 90% of them, 95% were convinced he was going to lose it. So that's why I was so confident about it. So he has lost. I know he was quite fidgety when it was happening. Uh, there was no outburst. I was expecting an outburst because during his appeal in December last year, he, he you know he did make a few outbursts during the court case, and the judge had to tell the barrister to have a word in his in his ear. But I think he he went quietly, shall we say? But look, it was you know it was four nil. He he lost everything. There wasn't. I don't think there was any thing he could take from the judgment. He really was shafted and goosed by this. But that's not the end. Of it. Yeah. I don't think anyway. No, and I, I think maybe there might have been a perception in the public domain um, that perhaps he, he had a good chance of winning this. And that's because of the European ruling um, in relation to uh, in relation to the seizure of his phone data, that basically it was in breach of uh, European law. And, and, and you, you might talk a bit more about that, Mick. So essentially what happened was for two years, all data providers, internet, phones, mobile companies, up until maybe 2019, had to keep everybody's data for two years. So if you if you and I, when you and I are, are texting each other about what brilliant journalists we are, those, not the actual text themselves, but the, but the Paul Healy texted Mick O'Toole would have been, there would be a call the log of it. And you also had cell site data analysts. So when you and I are in uh, Talbot Street in the Indo office and we ring somebody or somebody rings us, it pings off the nearest mast. So the location by tri- a thing called triangulation, you can say there's a very strong indication that Mikko Tulum, Paul Healy were in Talbot Street at half 11 last Thursday because their phones were active there. So they, he, he took his case first to the High Court in 2018. The High Court ruled that such mass retention of data for two years went, was contrary to European law. That was then That then went, the Supreme Court here then considered it and sent it to Europe for consideration, certain aspects of it. And the EU Court of Human Rights sided with Dwyer and decided that, you know, it did go against country to European law. Now, in my ignorance, because, I, you know, as I say, we're hacks, we're not legal experts. I was going, oh, Jesus, Dwyer has a very good chance there. But when you look at the appeal, it's very, very clear that that was probably a minor aspect of how the guards got him. But it, but the, but the ruling did have significant implications for a guardian. and I'll tell you why. Um, I remember doing a story about this in December 2019, January 2020, so shortly after the ruling. Gardaí use mobile phone data. They go and get uh, IP addresses. They're given IP addresses of men, and it's always men, who are suspected of viewing child sex abuse material. And they get IP addresses and they get warrants and they use all the data and then go and arrest or they go and uh, investigate the person and, and charge them if there is evidence. But because of the, the Dwyer ruling, that stopped. And there were about 700 men who Gardy had been given tip-offs about in late 18, early 19, during the 2020, for viewing child sex abuse material online. And the guards could not progress that. Now, the guards eventually did get a workaround that they could apply for different other warrants and got it. But it did have significant consequences for guard operations for quite some time. Now, we know that you know the two year rule is gone they're not they're not keeping them for two years now and i think the justice minister the interim justice minister simon harris is working on legislation 
to make it possible for Guardi to keep other data. But that's that's for the experts. But it really did have a significant aspect. And what I can say as well, from our sources, Paul, I think you and I would agree, Dwyer was very confident he was going to get on. Well, I mean, he's an intelligent person. And, and, and in fairness, he actually had exposed a, a genuine flaw in the law that I suppose no one saw coming but it's now as you've mentioned being addressed the government is enacting uh, or is is going to put through new legislation to address that particular issue but as you've described the case against Dwyer as a whole that is only one small minute uh, issue and and I think Mr Justice Birmingham did say something to the effect of that it was only a minuscule issue by comparison to all of the other evidence uh, that that the state had against Mr Dwyer now as you mentioned, this isn't the end of it. Graham Dwyer is probably going to take it to the Supreme Court and probably beyond that to the European courts as well, um, as he is entitled to do. Um, but but at this current juncture, that was a massive, massive loss for Graham Dwyer last Friday. And you are, you do a lot of stories about prisons. He has been, now, the first night upon conviction, so he, when he was on remand, he was so dangerous that the guards applied, asked the judge not to let him out on bail. Now, it's very high bar to have bail refused and that's when I'm talking about the bail hearings in 2013 and 2014 he lost went to the Supreme Court lost he was so dangerous so he was on remand at Clover Hill which is Ireland's remand prison which is beside uh, Wheatfield in West Dublin but on his first day of conviction automatically he was sent to Munjoy that's where all prisoners go for processing sentence prisoners go for processing but very quickly he was sent to the Midlands prison and he has been there ever since uh, yeah sorry just as you mentioned uh, about his imprisonment when he was on remand this is just an interesting little uh, fact and I think we did a story on it that at, at the the time when he was on remand he was actually um, briefly in a holding cell uh, with uh, Joe O'Reilly so the two of them were in the same holding cell area. And I think the story goes that supposedly Graham Dwyer said something to the effect of, are you the Joe O'Reilly? You know, so he was fascinated by who this individual is. And I'm told uh, from sources uh, in relation to Joe O'Reilly that Joe O'Reilly thought he was a, a bit of a bollocks and, and, and didn't even want to engage with him. So that, that's what that, that story is coming back to me. No, they, they weren't in remand because obviously he was... He was in he was in the Midlands at the time. In the holding cells in the courts, wasn't it? Sorry. The CCJ. And the story is, because I can remember someone telling me that Dwyer looked over at over at Joe O'Reilly and it sort of raised his eyebrows as if, aren't we the men? And I think, you know, o- O'Reilly was quite dismissive of him. So I, I I'm I'm gonna talk about Dwyer in a minute, but I, I was in a short uh, maybe a year, eighteen months after the verdict, I was let into the Midlands prison where he was being held. They were letting us in <clears throat> you know, to do a feature about the prison. Now, all the prisons were kept, uh, all the prisoners were kept away from me, thank God. But, and I was going to control rooms and stuff, but I just remember at one stage, there was a group of prisoners walked past, not past me, but maybe 40 feet away, right? And I looked over and one fella jumped out at me and it was Graham Dwyer. And I remember he was, he's quite small and he was up on tippy toes and he was talking to a fella and he had a ponytail and I was going, Jesus Christ. And I'd seen him every day, but even in that, and maybe it was 18 months or whatever, he really changed. And it was just remarkable to see see him like that in his own area <clears throat> or his own, you know, bailiwick, I suppose. Do you know what I'm going to say about Dwyer? Have you ever seen the film Seven? Yeah, I have, yeah. See, at the end, what, what do you call the, 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 the hero, the guy who shoots your man at the end? Uh, uh, Brad Pitt. Brad Pitt, when he goes to Kevin Spacey at the end, he effectively says to him, you're just going to be a midweek movie because your man Spacey wanted to be seen as infamous and all. And I, I like to think that about Dwyer. You know what? P- let people forget about it. We have to do stories and I make no apologies for doing stories because he's current. See, in 10 or 15 years' time, let him be somebody that you and I, will, when, when, when we're having a pint, go, Jesus, do you remember your man Dwyer? And he fades away. Because that's all he's worth for what he did to Elaine O'Hara and what he did to so many other people. Yeah, absolutely. I think he, he, he thought that he committed the perfect murder. And I think that's actually a line that was said to him by the guards when he was in interviews. Isn't that right? You thought you'd committed the perfect murder or you thought you'd got away with it? It was Detective Sergeant Peter Woods, who is one of the guards, main investigate, main interrogators or interviewers, shall we say. He's a, he's a level four, so there's, there's four levels. So they bring him in. Now, it just so happens he was the detective sergeant in charge of the case, but he is a top tier investigator. So the way it works is you're brought in and it's called the rapport phase first where you sit down and you have a chat. Oh, I'm just trying to get to know you. He's trying to get information out of him. And at the end, and it's all, the end is what they call the challenge phase. In other words, you did it. I put it to you, they did it. Because you have to say, I put it to you that you murdered. 
I put it to the Jewex, and he said to him, You idiot, you thought you had done the perfect crime. And I remember that because we had it as one of our, what we call it a walkie, headline the next day, you, you thought you had done the perfect crime. So that was real in your face and putting the hard questions to him. I would love to be in a fly in that interview room. Yeah, and I mean, again, this shows you the arrogance of the man. I mean, obviously, as evidenced by the fact that he took an appeal. But we know, and I think you had a story in today's Star, we know that Dwyer is still uh, telling people and insisting uh, in prison that he is innocent, that he didn't commit this murder. And he continues to state things like, uh, I didn't kill Elaine O'Hara and, and that nobody did because there's no evidence that she was even murdered. So he's continuing to deny and uh, openly deny to prisoners and anyone that will listen. Uh, that he had anything to do with yeah, this. Yeah, and he says things like, I was not in a relationship with Elaine El- El- O'Hara. I was trying to, I was training her, whatever that means, and I was trying to find a partner for her. And he goes, I didn't kill Elaine El- O'Hara. Nobody did. So, you know, he really is. But look, you're quite right. There's just a couple of th- I th- things that I think did for him. Now, once the body was, the remains were identified, I think it's inevitable that he would have become a suspect. And I'll tell you why, because Elaine had been using her own phone to talk to him for a while and she had backed up her phone on her phone and on her laptop. So there was a certain amount of information that guards would have had already. And in fact, in I think it was in her diary, she'd written the word Graham. Okay, so I think the guards would have struggled, but they would have got to him. And also you've got to remember, Chief Superintendent Jeremy O'Sullivan, who was the divisional officer for that area, got intelligence that Graham Dwyer. So in other words, while the Black Rock team were looking, he was given separate intelligence, with God knows, God knows by who, it's, they call it confidential information, that list that named Graham Dwyer as a suspect. So that's separate to all the investigations that the Gardaí did. But what the real clincher and the stuff that really built the picture was what James O'Donoghue did getting in the ground and finding those two phones. Now, it, look... It could have, it was just the happenstance of it, that happening around the same time as Elaine's body was found. The, the, the reservoir could have stayed high for another five years. And maybe in five years, you know, Dwyer would have been a suspect and suddenly the water would have gone and another guard or James O'Donoghue would have gone in and found them. And maybe they would have had a cold case about Elaine. But it was just the way the, those two worlds collided at the, exactly the same time and that did it. But there was other stuff that the guard had. They had intelligence and the guards had enough I think enough information without those phones, which were crucial really to secure a conviction. But they, I think they had enough to go towards him. And like, if you remember, you know, he was caught in CCTV going to Elaine's uh, apartment in Bellarmine Plaza in uh, Stepside at least twice. He's on CCTV at least twice. You know what I mean? So it's not as if uh, they were a smoking gun. They maybe the fire, maybe, but the bullets were other aspects that the guards had as well. So I think that's one of the reasons why the judge threw it out because there was so much other information apart from the phone data. But it was a remarkable case. It really was. And you know what? You know, we, I, I remember doing this. It was very disturbing just the way he, he spoke about it. I mean, there was a thing called, he wrote a piece, as I said, he wrote a piece, piece, of, piece of fiction called uh, Jenny's First Trip about how he was in a bookshop in Newcastle. He saw a woman, followed her, kidnapped her, brought her to his room and, and committed atrocious acts on her. And it was, you know, and it's, it's gore. He also did things like he was on websites, got like uh, gore.com. And we, he, we, you know, he was, there were, was evidence given of, of, of photos and images he was watching. Then he found a woman called Darcy Day who, in America who had, she, she would admit it, she had mental health problems. And he preyed upon her. And I remember she gave evidence in the court case. And there were things like, you know, he's, she sent him a photograph of herself and he over um, superimposed with his computer skills, superimposed innards of a woman on her stomach as if he'd eviscerated a woman. And, uh, you know, you know, just looking at that, it was, it was, it was you know, like a, a guts on top. It was just horrific to watch. So he really. And there was a video, was there not? There was a video, was there not, of, of him and Elaine as well, which everyone in the court saw? Yes, well, not, not, every, not everybody saw it, but everybody heard it. We, 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 the jury saw it and the, the, the legal team saw it, but it was played. And I can still remember there were several, several women, including Elaine. And I can remember there was one English or one lady with an English accent. Now, it was consensual. No problem. It was all consensual. But I can remember her screaming and I can remember goes, 
please bloody hell stop was what he was doing to her and then another occasion a woman was was crying and i remember him shushing her the way you would shush a baby you know shush, shush, shush. Now, she was like you know look um, it was consensual but it was just i, I get my stomach churning i have to say and if you speak to any journalist who, who sat through those i can still hear this the, the screams of the women now I'm, i have no problem saying it was consensual but just it wasn't right it wasn't nice so there were a lot of things and you know Darcy Day the videos him bringing a knife into the the bed the family bedroom you know and even you know one thing that always stuck with me when he was watching all this gore and he had his secret life he would log into the family computer under his name or whatever then he would log out and his poor wife would log into the same computer and she'd be blissfully unaware that he had all these things on his login and she was on the same computer and I'll tell you another thing right <clears throat> the guards believe he filmed the murder his fantasy what he did mention filming and, and the guards and they they did search for a sim card or an sd card or whatever they just couldn't call it couldn't find it but his fantasy was to stab a woman to death in a sex for his sexual gratification and that's what he did but he spoke about filming it so why would he not film it so imagine he did that right and just i also know that i'll put it this way i remember asking after the murder he went home and for the wife, she told her, nothing stands out that night. So he didn't come home and he wasn't panting because she can't remember that night, the, the 22nd of August, because it was just another night. You know what I mean? It, rather than coming home and being teary and, you know, whatever, it, there was no problem. And here's the other thing about Dwyer. Paul, you and I between us have covered hundreds of murders. How many murders have been planned as much as Dwyer planned that? I consider very few. Very, very few. Yeah, I mean, it's an extraordinary case, yeah. Yeah, Joe Riley planned the murder, but I don't think he planned it for that long. There have been and other also, murders that have been the motivations planned. Are, the motivations were, I mean, no, no, there's no justification for murder ever, but the motivations were a little more conventional in terms of a, a domestic situation. But this, <clears throat> the nature of this is, is just so random and extraordinary. I don't think we've ever seen anything like it yeah. before. Yeah, I, I, and, I, and I hope we never see anything like it because... Something happened with that fella and he became a bad one. That's just it. It makes you wonder how many more, uh, you know, see people with secret lives there are out there. I mean, you know, just you have to wonder. Uh, how, it makes you wonder. I, I'll say this. I, I know we're going to talk about the Annie McCarty case separately, but there's always been this fear about a serial killer in Ireland. And somebody said to me, what if there's not a serial killer? What if there's, there are eight men out there who have carried out horrific murders of women and are walking around? Which is worse? Yeah, uh, uh, thank God. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we, we, no doubt we'll still be talking about Graham Dwyer because, as I mentioned, uh, he's probably going to take it to the Supreme Court and to the European courts as well. So we'll see what happens. But thanks very much for listening. It's been fascinating to listen to you, Mick, and and you know your expertise on this. I haven't sat through every day of the trial, um, so thanks very much for your time. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> <laughs>